Note to the production team, what's about to happen in this vignette is I'm going to summarize the basic equations and symbols that we use for the joint random variables and then I'm going to pause and then bring in the textbook and illustrate some of these properties where they're at in the book and, and also extensions um, to, to a, a more complex kind of environment. So I will try to be very careful to pause and not say anything as I turn pages uh, will allow you to come back more easily and edit out some of those blank spots and patch this all together as you see fit. Okay, <clears throat> So I'm going to pause here for a moment and uh, grab the right color pen and then away we'll go um, and I think you'll see uh, pretty easily how this will all work. <coughs> Before we move on to the real important topics of covariance and correlation in our next lesson, let's go back and summarize where we've been with these joint random variables and the basic distribution models and terms and, and what they mean and our symbols that we're using there. Uh, we started off with a joint probability mass function and that was this piece of x and y are two random variables of interest taking on then two specific values. So the probability that x was equal to one value and that'd be the intersection event here, y equaling another value. Okay. And then we talked about <coughs> what that would look like from the marginal function view that say the marginal of x was what we were interested in, we can obtain that from the joint by summing over all of the y to get probability mass associated with a specific value of x. <coughs> we also talked about the conditional probability mass function and Note that we use that vertical bar for the conditioning event, so probability of y given x. And sometimes people put even the vertical bar right here in the arguments to this function. Right? And that, that is equal to the joint distribution divided by the marginal, the thing that we're conditioning upon. Right? So note the symbols that are in the subscripts become very important. They're the primary way that you distinguish between all these as well as potentially the arguments that are showing up there. Right? And by looking at that previous identity we could rewrite this in just in terms of the joint divided by the sum of the joint over our conditioning event, which in this case, note that we're conditioning on x, and to get that, we actually summed over all the y to get back to us. All right, now that's a little goofy when you start thinking about, well, originally we're conditioning on x, and why are we summing over all the y? Well, that was because of this right here, and the identity that we had in the, the previous one. Right, and then the last one, the concept that we really talked about was the notion of stochastic independence in that if you have stochastic independence between two random variables then the joint will be equal to the product of the marginals for all combinations of x and y. Right? And that just follows straight forward that if they are independent then telling me something about x tells me nothing about the random variability of y. So this just becomes simply equal to the marginal of y and that drops in right there. Let's look at <coughs> please production team edit that out. We're going to go to the book now.
So let's look at what this all is like in your textbook and some of the properties that are real important that are going to show up. This is in chapter 5 and you'll note that in chapter 5, page 153, is the beginning of this particular chapter right, on two or more random variables. Some of these key identities that we just talked about for a joint probability mass function, we didn't explicitly call this out, but note that all probabilities have to be greater than equal to zero. We had a similar um, identity for probability mass function for a single variable, and it's certainly true here. Note that if we sum over all of the different con uh, combinations of x and y, we have to end up with, well, that equaling to 1. So same kind of identity as we had before in there is just the mean of the probability mass function, or at least the notation. And this is written for discrete random variables, two discrete random variables. On the next page, on page 155, you see what this looks like for continuous random variables. Right? And here now, it's not probability mass, but probability density that we're looking at. And once again, the density has to be greater than or equal to zero for there to be a physically significant uh, meaning. And now when we look at the identity, instead of, of, of looking at all of the various probabilities, remember now that we're going to take a density times something here. Well, now this is, because it's a density and we have two variables, we're going to multiply by an area. So the units on our density are a little bit different than they were before. They're going to be probability divided by the units of x and divided by the units of y, so that when we multiply back by a differential area, we get back units of probability. And we add up all of the different combinations, right? Integration is nothing more than adding, but on a, in a differential kind of manner then we're going to get total probability of 1. And if we want the probability then that our two variables are in a region of space, not a specific value, but in a region of space, well, then we're going to do the area integral, right? So we're really coming up with a volume, and that's what you see up at the top of the page. That when we plot this function, this joint density function, then it becomes three-dimensional. We have x in one direction, y in the other direction, right? And so this double integral that we are talking about to find a specific region is really then just the volume under that particular density function. What you have in the text as an example of doing this double integration is here. And we won't go through it. I just want to point out to you that here's one example. If you have a joint density function that is actually amenable to doing closed form integration, or if you really have this form, so often we don't, we just have some sort of estimate of this kind of equation. Sometimes, though, when we have it, it's not a very tractable one, and we have to do numerical integration as opposed to a closed form integration. You'll also, again, please edit that out, production team. We talked about marginal probability mass functions. Here's what it looks like for the continuous world, right? We have a joint up here, and if we want the marginal, then we're going to sum, or in this case now, because it's continuous, we're going to integrate over all of the other possibilities and that will get us then back to the marginal. Or we can integrate the joint with respect to the other random variable and get the other marginal. And again we have for now the conditional case the same kind of situation as we had for the probability mass. Now we have it for the continuous same kind of relationship that we had before. The interesting thing that we end up here with is that we didn't talk about for the discrete that you could actually have a zero down in the denominator. And if so, what does that mean? Uh, that's an interesting pathological kind of case. So 
we're going to restrict ourselves to only looking at the cases where the probability densities of probability masses are greater than zero um, and of course it means that the conditional is not defined um, if you do have a zero that's sitting down there. See down below uh, properties associated with this conditional probability density function. These will be useful and valuable to us when we want to go uh, evaluate the expected value of y given x. In other words, the, the conditional expected value. On page 162, we hit this important definition of independence for continuous random variables. It looks very similar to what we did before, right? That the uh, joint distribution will be a product of the marginals for all combinations of x and y. We only have to find one instance where that's not true to, to the conclude that the two random variables are uh, dependent. This is, though, crucial to us when we have independence. It allows us to do a whole lot of closed form uh, development that we wouldn't be able to do very easily otherwise. It's also very convenient to assume independence so that we can likewise go and develop some tractable models uh, to use. It creates some potential inaccuracies and imprecisions sometimes as a result, meaning that we might have models that are only fine-tuned for certain regions, uh, but oftentimes we're willing to accept that for the particular uh, situation that we're interested in. And then there's these other properties of these uh, conditional distributions that are at work when we have stochastic independence, namely that the conditional now is equal to the marginal because uh, knowing something about the other variable doesn't tell us anything stochastically about what we want. And now we get to the extensions the really complicated stuff. What if we have more than one random variable? And the expressions that you're about to see are, are going to be associated with the continuous uh, random variables, but there is an equal uh, item over in the, the discrete versions. And actually, the mix between the two is, is fairly straightforward. It's just the difference between substituting in a summation sign instead of an integration sign. Right? And so here again, if we have a whole bunch of random variables and looking ahead where might that come into play well when we take uh, a collected set of data say you know remember we had 400 different 30 second intervals that we were looking at before in that one example well in a sense each one of those 30 second intervals was random so in some ways you could look at that as potentially a collection of 400 different random quantities another take on that uh, um, particular uh, example and we'll actually explore that later on when we get into distribution on the sample mean and distribution on the sample uh, variance or sample standard deviation. Right? Here just note we've got this multinomial or multivariable that is probability density function for a whole lot of random variables we get this continuous or total probability property here for the continuous random variable. And then if we want to look at a specific likelihood of these random variables falling within a particular region, then we've got this multiple integration. If we have p number of random variables, well, then we have p intervals that we have to go take a look at. And for those multiple ones, you get marginal density functions, right? can get rid of the dependence on all these other ones. You get also for these multiple random variables, you get expected values and expected variances, excuse me, variances and expected values or means. All same kind of thing. These are just extensions of the idea of what we've been doing before. And finally, <coughs> And finally, then, and finally, then we get the notion that if we have independence and we have 
p random variables then this joint distribution of those is simply a product of the p different or I should say just simply p marginal distributions they may be similar they may be different doesn't really matter if they're independent though then it's just a nice simple thing here and we will use that result uh, again later on when we get into looking at sampling means and uh, the distribution of the sampling means in that case what we're going to talk about is independent and identically distributed random variable so x1 through xp will turn out to be well yeah we'll have p multiples of these but since they're identically distributed well all of these look the same and we can do some simplifications as a result of that production team thus ends the summary